In the name of Jesus, whose humble service has set us free, the fellow redeemed. Tell me, what would you think if before the season began, Coach Matt LaFleur came right out and said, our goal this year for the Green Bay Packers is to finish last in our division. We're, we're, yep, we're striving to be at the bottom. What? <laughs> that's crazy talk. That's, that's not what an athletic team does. They don't want to be at the bottom. They want to be at the top. Same thing is true for political candidates, right? Can you imagine Donald Trump saying, yep, I, I fully committed to being the second best candidate this year. Can you imagine an, an Olympic athlete saying, boy, I hope I don't have to climb up on that podium and have some medal around my neck. Deep down, everybody wants to win. That's why we train. That's why we compete. So that we don't end up at the bottom. We want to end up at the top. The question is, at the top of what? What do we want to be really good at? Well, of course, our sinful nature would like us to be good at some things that aren't so good. Things like winning the argument or putting people in their place or accumulating all kinds of stuff. As Christians... God gives us a little different perspective about what we should be striving for. In our text for today, Jesus says that anyone who wants to be first must be the very last. In other words, God is saying if what we should really be working for is not striving to be first, but to be last. In fact, that's our theme for today. Christian, strive to be last. As we look at this section of Scripture, we'll see that that's an attitude that Jesus displayed in his life, and it's an attitude that Jesus' followers reflect in our lives. Our text for today finds Jesus traveling with his disciples throughout Galilee. He's just come down from the Mount of Transfiguration where he revealed his glory to three of his disciples. And now he's beginning to teach them about what's coming in his future. And he speaks pretty bluntly. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him and after three days he will rise. How did the disciples react to that announcement? Mark tells us. They did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Or maybe more likely, they didn't want to understand. They couldn't fathom the concept of the Son of God whose glory and power they had seen in many different situations was now going to be a loser, was now going to be handed over to sinful men. They couldn't fathom that, and they couldn't fathom what that might mean for them, right? Up until this time, they, they're kind of riding the wave of Jesus' popularity, right? They, they hooked themselves to a winner, right? They were expecting all kinds of good things to happen. What they couldn't fathom is that in order for Jesus to be the true winner, to, to win the war against Satan, he would have to lose his life. But Jesus understood that. Jesus knew that for him to rescue fallen mankind, he was going to have to lose. He'd have to, in effect, go to the end of the line. In fact, isn't that what the Apostle Paul said describing Jesus in his letter to the Philippians? Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, didn't have to show off that he was God. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He's talking about moving from a position of power and authority to a position of humility. There it is. It's that same spirit that Jesus showed when even though he was the the master of the Passover meal, he still got down on his hands and knees and washed the dirty, stinking feet of his disciples. He, he became a slave. It's that, it's that same spirit that he showed when he cried out from the cross, it is finished. In fact, all of that is in fulfillment of Jesus' words. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now you might think that when Jesus made that announcement to his disciples, it would have got them to start talking about that, thinking about that, debating that. What what is going to happen here? That's a pretty important announcement, but that's not what they're talking about. Instead, what are the disciples talking about? Mark tells us. Jesus and his disciples came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Mark tells us. They kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Yikes. Can you imagine how those disciples must have felt realizing... Oh, oh, Jesus heard that, what, what we were talking about? Kind of reminds me when I was a kid, a kid, we went camping in the backyard of our house with my little grade school buddy. And while we were out there in the dark, we were talking about things we probably shouldn't have been talking about, you know, kind of the birds and bees. And the next thing you know, we hear this voice outside the tent. It's my dad saying, hey, how are you kids doing in there? We're going, yikes. Did he just hear what we were talking about? That's not good. Don't you think that's what these disciples were feeling? Arguing about who's the greatest while Jesus is preparing to give his life for them? And yet, should that surprise us? Every one of these disciples had a sinful nature, a sinful nature that always says, me first, right? Even though they'd spent three years with Jesus, they weren't above jealousy, rivalry. They all kind of wanted to push themselves to the front of the line. They, They all wanted to be number one. But tell me, are they the only ones guilty of the sin of pride? or self-promotion? Are we guilty of the same thing? I mean, maybe, maybe we don't, you know, walk around like Muhammad Ali saying, I am the greatest. No, chances are it's a little more subtle than that. We might go around sit, telling everybody about how, how busy we always are, implying that we work harder than anybody else, And that we are just indispensable to the people around us. They, everybody needs us. Everybody needs me. Everybody wants me. Or maybe we kind of push ourselves to the front of the line by thinking that, well, you know, what we think is more important than what anybody else thinks. And we're going to do more talking than listening. And we don't really care about how other people think. We're going we're gonna to use our influence, going to use our position, going to use our charms to get what we want. These are the things that happen when we strive to be first. First in our own eyes, great in the eyes of the world. Here in our text, Jesus tells us that there's a different kind of, of greatness. And it's a greatness that doesn't involve pride, but rather humility. 
Jesus puts it this way. Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. I don't know about you, but I, I find that passage interesting. It's, it's like it's a paradox. I mean, Jesus is, in effect, saying, it's okay to be first. It's okay to, to be your best. The question is, what do you want to be first at? Jesus says, be first at being last. In other words, letting other people go first. Letting their voices be heard. Making sure their needs are met. Making sure that they are lifted up and put in a place of honor. Kind of reminds me of that the parable that Jesus once told about picking seats at the wedding banquet. Remember that? Jesus put it this way. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You know, for, for a long time, this parable kind of bothered me. You know why? Some of you realize that every time Mount Olive has a, a funeral, the, the ladies typically put on a luncheon for the family. And then they have the family sit at the head table in kind of a position of honor. And at the end of that table, there's always a little sign that says, Pastor. That's where I'm supposed to sit, like at the head of the table, like first in line for the hot ham buns. And every time I, I see that sign, I, I think of this parable and think, should I really be sitting here? I should, I should really go to the back. Wouldn't that be the humble thing to do? But over the course of time, I've come to realize, no, actually, it's not wrong for me to sit in that seat of honor for two reasons. First, because I didn't choose it. I'd just as soon sit in the back. Somebody else chose it for me. The host of the meal, kind of like in Jesus' parable, the host, the lady's aide said, Pastor, come, come on up. Here's where you're sitting. Okay, in deference to that, I'll, I'll sit there. But there's a more important reason why I sit there. And it's found in this very verse where Jesus says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. There's the key. No matter where God puts you in life, no matter what position you are in, whether it's at the head of the table or at the foot of the table, our job is always the same. It's to be a servant. As a pastor, my service to the grieving family doesn't end when I say amen at the end of the worship service. It continues as I sit with that grieving spouse and break bread with them, as we, we celebrate the grace that God showed to their loved one. That's, that's part of serving. It's, what, it's actually what the word minister means, a servant. But you realize that's not just true of you know, full-time called workers. It's true of every Christian. God gives us a task. Paul says we are to serve one another humbly in love. In fact, to, to give an example of that kind of humble service, Jesus does what? He calls a little child up. And he puts the child in his lap, and he says what? 
Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Why, why did Jesus do that? Why does, he, why does he pick a little child to be kind of this object lesson for the disciples? I can think of two reasons. First, because children need help. <laughs> they, they need somebody bigger than they are, somebody who is the authority, somebody who can use that position of authority in love to meet their needs, to bend down and wipe off their runny nose or change their diapers or change their, put their shoe on again. Oftentimes there, there's no glory in that, right? It, it's not like we're, you know, the bodyguard for the President of the United States. No, we're probably just, you know, wiping sticky jelly off kids' fingers. But it's still service. And we, and we offer that service not expecting something in return. We're not expecting to be compensated for it. I've never heard a three-year-old say, Mom, will you flip that iPad around so I can add a little gratuity to your service of my you know, mac and cheese today? No, it doesn't happen. A lot of the, the service that we render to children goes completely unnoticed unappreciated, right? Uh, I may be wrong, but I, I don't think any of the Sunday school teachers are being lifted up on shoulders saying, way to go, way to teach those little kids. But that's okay. Because we're not serving to get something. We're serving because God has already given us something. Something. He's given us Jesus. He's given us Jesus on the cross to assure us that we are loved by God. We don't have to work to earn God's favor. We, we already have it. We're, we're free. In, in Christ, we have everything. And, and it's that fact that gives us as Christians the freedom to say, not me first, but rather you first, and you, and you, and you. <laughs> See, as followers of Jesus, we say, let me be the first to be last. Let me be the, the servant of all. For you see, that's how followers of Jesus reflect the humble service that Jesus showed to us first. To him be the glory. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. We hope that God's word has strengthened your faith. To help us know more about the reach of our efforts here at Manav, we hope that you'll like and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages and that you also sign our online friendship register to let us know that you're listening today. God bless and keep you.